welcome to Indus News. Live from Islamabad, I'm Naila Shuja and these are the headlines. Prime Minister Imran Khan says peace in Afghanistan is essential for Pakistan and Tajikistan. Addressing a press conference along with Tajik President Imam Ali Rahman in Islamabad, Khan said there must be a political settlement in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal. Prime Minister Khan and President Rahman also witnessed signing of bilateral agreements in various fields including trade and defense. At least 12 people have been killed and dozen others wounded as three bombs rattled Afghanistan's capital city of Kabul. The Interior Ministry said the bombings happened in mostly ethnic Hazara area of the capital. The Taliban have denied their involvement while no other group has claimed responsibility yet. At least eight people have been killed and scores injured when PKK forces opened fire on protesters in the Syrian city of Manbij. The demonstrators were demanding an end to the Kurdish minority rule over mainly Arab tribal population in the city. In Israel, opposition leader Yair Lapid has finalized terms with Defense Minister Benny Gantz, Blue and White Party to form a coalition government. In a joint statement, Lapid's and Gantz parties said they have agreed on the terms of governance. Lapid has secured deals with various parties to oust Prime Minister Netanyahu, but he has yet to finalize terms with main partner Naftali Bennett. India has reported more than 1,032,000 new hundred cases so far, over 3,200 deaths overnight. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 80 people have lost their lives to the virus and over 1,800 tested positive in the past 24 hours. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.5 million lives and infected over 171 million people. For more news and details, stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. Prime Minister Imran Khan says peace in Afghanistan is essential for Pakistan and Tajikistan. He was addressing a press conference along with Tajik President Imam Ali Rahman in Islamabad. Prime Minister Khan said there must be a political settlement in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal. He said violence may erupt once the international troops leave the territory. The Prime Minister said there will be no trade with India until it restores the special status of Kashmir. Prime Minister Khan and President Rahman also witnessed the signing of bilateral agreements in various fields, including trade and defense. Prime Minister Khan said that the Gobadar port will boost bilateral trade between the two countries. The Tajik president reaffirmed his support to Pakistan for peace in the region. He also both the countries can cooperate in the fields of agriculture and food security. At least 12 people have been killed and a dozen others wounded as three bombs rattled Afghanistan's capital city of Kabul. The Interior Ministry said the bombings happened in a mostly ethnic Hazarak area of the capital. The Taliban have denied their involvement while no other group has claimed responsibility yet. Meanwhile, the Taliban claim to have killed dozens of policemen in Nangarhar and Logar province. In a tweet, a Taliban spokesperson also accused Afghan forces of injuring eight civilians by firing mortars in Baghlan province. The government did not comment on the Taliban's claim. NATO Secretary General Jens Lotenberg says the alliance will continue to support Afghan forces even after the withdrawal of foreign troops. Speaking in Brussels, he said the NATO foreign ministers have agreed that it's the best way to contribute to the Afghan peace. Slotenberg said the U.S. will continue to fund the Afghan forces and provide them to advise and capacity building support. He said NATO is reducing its presence in Afghanistan despite the security situation remains challenging. 
Meanwhile, U.S. Central Command said the withdrawal process has been completed up to 44 percent. According to a U.S. defense official, Washington will hand over its biggest Bahram air base to Afghan forces in about 20 days. China will virtually host the fourth China-Afghanistan-Pakistan Trilateral Foreign Ministers Dialogue on Thursday. The announcement has been made by China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi will preside over the meeting. According to Chinese state media, the ministers will discuss the current peace and reconciliation process in Afghanistan. Matters related to security cooperation and counterterrorism measures will also be discussed. In Syria, at least eight people have been killed and scores injured when Kurdish-led forces fired live rounds at protesters in Manpij. The people are demanding the end of Kurdish minority rule over a mainly Arab tribunal population. The U.S.-backed forces imposed a curfew on the city and beefed up checkposts around its main routes. Many shops heed a call for a general strike. This came a day after security forces killed another person in demonstrations. Meanwhile, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield is set to visit Turkey-Syria border. She will convey Washington's strong support for humanitarian access into Syria. Israel says it has destroyed a Syrian army observation post in the occupied Golan Heights. In a tweet, a military spokesperson said Tel Aviv will not tolerate any attempt to violate its sovereignty. He said Israeli troops stormed the post and detonated it with explosive devices. The spokesperson said this is the third such Israeli occupation in Syria in the past year. There are no immediate reports of casualties in the strike. The Golan Heights, a strategic military zone, was seized by Israel from Syria during the 1967 Six-Day War. In Israel, opposition leader Yair Lapid has finalized terms with Defense Minister Benny Gantz's Blue and White Party to form a coalition government. In a joint statement, Lapid's and Gantz's party said they have agreed on the terms of governance and other core issues. Netanyahu's opponents also finalized terms with various other parties to finalize the coalition setup before a Wednesday midnight deadline. However, Lapid is yet to clinch a deal with his main partner, Naftali Bennett, who would serve as premier first under a proposed rotation. The development moves Benjamin Netanyahu closer to being unseated as the longest-serving prime minister of Israel. The African Union has suspended Mali's membership in response to last week's military coup. In a statement, the bloc called for a transparent and swift return to the civilian-led transition. It threatened to impose sanctions on Bamako if the constitutional order is not restored. The bloc called on the Malayan security forces immediately to lift all sanctions on the political leadership. Last week, Mali's junta arrested the interim leadership and pressured them to resign. The West African bloc ECOWAS suspended Mali's membership on Sunday. India has reported more than 132,000 new coronavirus cases and over 3,200 deaths overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.5 million lives and infected over 171 million people. More in this report. As the COVID-19 pandemic lingers on, it has rendered irreparable losses to communities around the world. A new report suggests that Africa now faces increasing recession, growing violence and higher unemployment. But many rich nations continue on the path to recovery after a year of debts and distress with their ample resources. Britain is in talks with AstraZeneca for the doses of their vaccine modified to better target the variant first identified in South Africa. Japan is also reportedly planning to pledge an additional $800 million to World Health Organization's COVAX program. Meanwhile, World Health Organization says the newly approved China Sinovac vaccine prevents symptomatic disease in 51% of those vaccinated and prevents severe symptoms and hospitalization in 100% of samples. And today, I'm happy to announce that the Sinovac Coronavac vaccine has been given WHO emergency use listing after being found to be safe, effective and quality assured following two doses of the inactivated vaccine. Furthermore, the easy storage requirements of Coronavac make it very suitable for low resource settings. 
In India, while the second wave recedes, doctors continue to see an uptick in the host of dangerous fungal infections. The health ministry plans to more than triple the daily vaccinations by going from 3 million to 10 million doses a day in July and August. Meanwhile, in Australia, Victoria State has extended the snap lockdown for another week to contain the outbreak of the highly contagious gamma variant. In the end, this is about saving lives. It's why, on the advice of the Chief Health Officer, Professor Sutton, the current restrictions remain in place for Melbourne for a further seven days with some small changes. Israel says the small number of heart inflammation cases, mainly in young men who received Pfizer's vaccine, were likely linked to their vaccination. Turkmenistan's president has claimed in a rare foreign interview that the Central Asian country has suffered no coronavirus cases. In Pakistan, 80 more people have died of coronavirus over the past 24 hours. The health ministry says the country's death toll is approaching 21,000. The ministry reported over 1,800 infections overnight, pushing the nationwide caseload above 924,000. Over 848,000 people have recovered from the virus so far, whereas the number of active cases stands at 55,000. Over 3,700 of them are in critical condition. Moscow says it is not expecting any breakthrough when the Russian and U.S. presidents will hold their first summit this month. In a press briefing, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov ruled out any historic fateful decisions in the meeting. Lavrov urged the West to tone down its rhetoric if the hopes to have its a fruitful relationship with Russia. He also accused NATO of carrying out significant military exercises in proximity to Russia and refusing to discuss de-escalation. Since taking office, President Biden has imposed new sanctions against Moscow. The U.S. alleges that Russia is behind the massive solar wind cyber attack and meddling in the 2020 presidential election. In Myanmar, the anti-coup activists have continued their rallies in Mandalay and Sagaing region. Meanwhile, Indonesia has called on ASEAN to immediately appoint an envoy to Myanmar. At a news conference, the country's foreign minister, Retno Marsudi, said an inclusive dialogue should be occurred to solve the political crisis. Burma's civil disobedience group has welcomed the Marsudi's call. It said that it is not the only one disappointed with ASEAN's lack of progress. In April, the bloc reached a five-point consensus on Myanmar, including ending the junta's violence. The security forces have killed over 840 civilians in a brutal crackdown on dissent following the February 1st coup. Chile's President Sebastian Pinera has called for open talks to draft the new constitution. Pinera's ruling coalition suffered a big loss last month in the election of representatives to work on the constitution. The outgoing president urged 155 elected representatives to abandon the politics of the trenches. In his annual State of the Nation address, Pinera said he will convene the new body in the coming days. He expressed hope that the constitutional convention will respect the limits and rules of its mandate. The representatives have nine months to write the constitution, which will then be submitted to a mandatory plebiscite. It's now time for a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. U.S. President Joe Biden has honored the Tulsa massacre survivors 100 years on during his visit to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Biden is the first sitting U.S. president to visit the site where hundreds of black Americans were massacred by a white mob in 1921. The president observed a moment of silence for the victims of the horrific massacre after meeting with the three survivors. He delivered an emotional speech to mark the country's legacy of racial violence. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence, cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. And while darkness can hide much, it erases nothing. It erases nothing. Some injustices are so heinous, so horrific, so grievous, they can't be buried no matter how hard people try. 
earlier Biden toured the Greenwood Cultural Center and went through photographs and news articles explaining how the massacre developed. Moving on, the U.S. state of Florida has banned transgender women and girls from participating in college and high school sports. Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Montana, Tennessee, and West Virginia have already passed the similar legislation. The legislation makes Florida the latest and the largest state in the country to impose the ban. Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed the bill at an event at a Christian school in Jacksonville. DeSantis said that the law was needed to ensure fairness for women participating in sports across the state. Supporters of the bill say transgender athletes have an unfair advantage, having been designated male at birth. Meanwhile, the Democrats and civil rights advocates have slammed the legislation as unnecessary and discriminatory. In the U.S., a firefighter shot one colleague to death and severely wounded another at their Los Angeles County firehouse. Officials say the suspect apparently took his own life outside his home, which went up in flames later. Sheriff's local said that no gunshots were fired by law enforcement. The suspected gunman, identified as an off-duty fireman, returned to the station for some reason. He then opened fire on his two co-workers there. Authorities say they have yet to determine a possible motive. Motive of the crime, we're unsure yet. We still have to conduct interviews with all the fire station personnel that worked at the station all three shifts, family members, conduct next of kin notifications, process both crime scenes, first the firehouse, and then ultimately the uh, house that is on fire once it's deemed to be safe to process. The largest ship in the Iranian Navy caught fire and later sank in the Gulf of Oman under mysterious circumstances. In a statement, the Iranian Navy said all crew on the board training vessel Karak disembarked safely. It was in the waters near the Iranian port of Jusk on a training mission. State media said the firefighting operations continued for hours, but efforts to save the ship failed. In April, Iran said one of its vessels, the Savez, was targeted in the Red Sea. The U.S. has urged Central American governments to do more to help contain illegal immigration. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was speaking at a news conference with his Costa Rican president, counterpart Carlos Alvarado in San Jose. Blinken said good governance is crucial for confronting challenges and seizing the opportunities of the moment. He said regional cooperation to address the migratory pressures is now more important than ever. However, the top U.S. diplomat voiced concerns about the health of local democracy and human rights in the region. Lincoln is traveling to Costa Rica to hold talks with leaders from Central America and Mexico. The U.S. says it is investigating a ransomware attack on the world's largest meat-producing company, JBS. The company said its computer networks were hacked, causing some operations in Australia, Canada and the U.S. to temporarily shut down. The White House says Brazil's JPS informed Washington that the attack was organized by Russia-based criminal organization. Talking to media, spokesperson John Perry said the U.S. is engaging directly with Russia on the matter. John Perry added that the FBI is leading an investigation into the attack. Meanwhile, JBS says that it has made significant process in resolving the cyber attack and a majority of its plans will be operational from today. In China, He Longyang province, one person has died and 16 others are injured after a tornado hit Shangzi City. Local media says the injured are being treated at the hospital with one in serious condition. State media reported that at least 148 houses as well as farmland and factories have been damaged. The storm also caused power outages and the suspension of a high-speed railway section. The tornado along with hail hit four counties in the city. The world's largest acrylic swimming pool has opened in London, offering skyline views. But it is suspended between two tall residential buildings 100 feet above the ground. Londoners bathe in the sun and swim in the 10 feet deep pool. The transparent structure is 25 meters in length and takes 375 tons of water to fill. Located near the U.S. Embassy, the pool offers a vantage point for London's trade landmarks. It has been designed by architects Arup Associates, aquarium designers Reynold and structural engineers Elkersley O'Callaghan. The pool was manufactured in the U.S. state of Colorado before its journey across the Atlantic to the British capital.
United States and China have agreed to maintain communication on economic ties. Chinese Vice Premier Liu He held a video conference with U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. China's Commerce Ministry said that they had extensive exchanges on the macroeconomic situation and multilateral cooperation. It added the two leaders exchanged views on issues of mutual concern. Meanwhile, the U.S. Treasury Department says Yellen stressed the importance of cooperating on areas that are in U.S. interest. This is the second round of talks within a week between the top economic and trade officials of the two countries. European stocks have inched towards record levels fueled by energy and consumer stocks. Meanwhile, the strong economic data from the U.S. and Europe boosted investor sentiment. The pan-European stock 600 index hovered 0.1 percent above the flat line, holding just below its all-time high hit in the previous session. Oil and gas stocks added 0.6 percent to lead the gains, while basic resources fell 0.5 percent. The FTSE 100 edged 0.2 percent higher and crossed the 7,000 mark for the first time since early May, while France's CAC 40 and the Germany's DAX rose 0.2 percent after the opening bell. It's now time to take a look at the weather updates from around the world. For the latest news updates, you can follow us on our social media at Indus.news.